many of you love Jesus? How many of you are glad that he found you? Come on, you aren't looking for him when he found you. He found me. He reached down into my life. He picked me up from where I was. He wasn't concerned about my imperfections. He found me. Amen. So good to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. They're reaching way down deep into the bottom of the barrel to find a backup. Brother Bickley asked if I was a long-winded preacher or not. I told him I don't know. I preach often enough to know. So you, we'll have to find out, right? Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, we want to turn in the word of the Lord to John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4, starting with verse number 4. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. And he must needs, speaking of Jesus, go through Samaria. Or Jesus really, really needed to go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son, Joseph. Now Joseph's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, with, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him shall be in him a well of, of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go and call thy husband. I'm going to skip down a few verses. In verse number 20, he she says, Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, but ye say, talking about Jesus being a Jew, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what, but we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. The Father seeketh such to worship him. I want to talk a little bit this morning about being found of God. Or it might be more appropriate to say when, when God hunts us down. I I, uh, I follow on Twitter uh, things that are going on on the, the Temple Mount. It, you know, things in this world are, are very chaotic in the Middle East. There's all kinds of terrorism that we see on a daily basis, and and much of it goes back to, to, to one central issue, who is God? And, uh, you know, I, I see things that... that are going on on the Temple Mount. Uh, imagine if, if you didn't have permission in your own country to worship God the way that you want to. In the most sacred place that you consider, that you're not allowed to, to pray. If you don't know this, but the Jews that go and get to visit on the Temple Mount are not allowed to pray 
at the Temple Mount. They're not allowed because it is controlled by Muslims. And so if someone is praying anything other than to Allah, uh, you can be arrested and, and taken off the mount. And, and you see this going on, and it, it's, it's, it's disturbing, but it's, it's going on. It's happening right now. And, and there is this desire for them to, to, to have the temple reestablished there. But there's so much turmoil, so much chaos all surrounding who is God and who should own this place of worship. And uh, the Muslims don't consider it the most sacred place. For them, Mecca is the most sacred place. And so they pray towards Mecca. And so when you see the Jews praying in Jerusalem, they are praying towards the Temple Mount. And when you see the Muslims pray, you see them praying towards Mecca. And I'm saying all this because Jesus said 2,000 years ago that none of this stuff really mattered. We've got so many people so concerned over the place where God used to be that they're no longer, they no longer really know or understand where He is. And so they're still searching for God and still seeking for God and they're still showing up to places and praying at a wall or praying at a, at a temple mountain or praying where God used to, where God's presence used to be, where he used to show up. But Jesus told a lady over 2,000 years ago that, that the time is already here. That there is coming a time and it has already arrived when the people that are going to worship God are going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And then He goes on to say that that, that not only is he, He is seeking those. He is actively seeking, searching, looking for people who would worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is looking for us. He's looking for you. He's looking for me. He is searching through this earth trying to find someone who would worship him in spirit and in truth. We we know that without faith it is impossible to please God. We know what the scripture says about faith, that without it it is impossible to please God, that if we come to God we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that will diligently seek him. I don't know about you, but when I was a, a young person, I, I haven't always hungered for God, but there was a time in my life where I hungered for him in my youth. And uh, I, I prayed, I fasted, I, I, I did things that, that helped me to find God. But there are also times when God finds us. The scripture says that no one can come to God. No one can come to God except the Father draw them. We understand that. Do you understand that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance? That that it's not you looking for God. That it's not you searching for God. That it's not you hungering for God that prompts you to move toward God. That it is Him looking for you. That it is Him searching for you. It's not your act, it's His act. No one can come to God except the Father draw. And I know many times we miss the drawing and we miss the timing and we miss the move of God. And many people do that, but I promise you, None of us come to God without His prompting, without His reaching, without His moving, without His stretching out His arm towards us, reaching down into our lives and picking us up. And there was a time in my life when I wasn't really looking for God. I grew up in church. I grew up playing Hot Wheels under the pews. You know, I... That's just what I did, you know. I mean, now you have iPads, but I didn't have an iPad back then, so I played Hot Wheels under the pew, you know. And and I would do my own thing, and I would go down at the end of service, and I would repent. I didn't know what the preacher preached, but I was still going to repent because that's just what everybody did, man. And I needed to repent, so I just go up and I repent every Sunday, you know. I grew up under the pew, but 
but all of that was kind of just doing what my parents wanted me to do and, and going and showing up. But there came a time where, where I began to rebel against God and I began to do my own thing and, and I had to make a decision if I was going to seek God or if I was going to go my own way. And it was in that period of time that, that God truly found me. It wasn't in the time of my life when I was hungering for him that he found me. It wasn't in the time of my life that I was praying, that I was fasting, that I was seeking for him that he found me. It was in the time of my life when I was starting to stray. It was in the time of my life when I was doing my own thing. It was in the time of my life when I was starting to take my own direction that God showed up in my life, that he reached down into my life, that he just showed up and let me know that he would be near, that he was close, that he, he was just not letting me go without knocking at my door, without pausing me and making me question what I'm doing in my life. You see, the Apostle Paul told the people that, that they did not know what they were worshiping. In Acts chapter 17, verse number 24, Paul begins to tell the people that God made the world and all things therein. And he, he's not a God that dwells in temple made by human hands. That, that God is, is everywhere. Yet, how is it that so many people cannot find God? A God that is everywhere. A God that has glorified his name in the earth. A God that has that has manifested his presence. He did not leave us without signs, the scripture says, of his presence, of his existence. He gave us signs. He gave us wonders. He gave us all of these things so that we would know him, so that we could know him. And yet there was a people that was worshiping every kind of God. And they were worshiping every kind of God that they did not know. And they even had an altar to the unknown God. And Paul began to declare to them the unknown God. And he said... He said, you don't even know what you're worshiping, but I'm going to declare this God to you, the one that created heavens and the earth. Because he made us so that we could seek the Lord, if haply we might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. We live in him, we move in him, yet so many of us don't know him. He's not far from us, but so many times we are so aimless, so careless with our choices, with our decisions of life, that we can't find God. We can't find him. We look for him, but we can't find him. Or maybe we don't really care about finding God. I'm amazed at the times when God finds us and we're not really looking for him. But God's looking for you. Did you know that? God's looking for you. He's seeking someone who would worship him. Isaiah said, seek the Lord while he may be found and call up him while he is near. Jeremiah said that you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I think it's great that some people find God when they are seeking him with all of their heart, but I know there's many people that have the testimony that God found them when they weren't looking for him. I remember Brother Jerry State, and some of you know him. He's a uh, pastor in D.C. He shared his testimony with Antioch many years ago, several years ago when we had moved here, and about how God found him. And it, it's, it's an amazing story because as a young kid, he, had, he, he grew up in a home where his parents divorced. Uh, I believe his father was even a, a, a preacher, a pastor at one time. And, uh, but at a very young age, something happened in their lives and his parents separated. And so he, at a very young age, he had a decision to make. His father wasn't going to church. His mom was going to church. And so he had to choose whether or not he was going to go to church. And he chose 
to begin to miss church, and, and that led him down this path of life where he, he no longer hungered for the things of God. And it wasn't long, and, and, and he was into all the things that, that you can imagine a, a young person would get into, and even worse, drugs, alcohol, addictions were all just a normal part of his life. People that had tried to, to help him, he had ignored. And uh, when he graduated, he got drafted into the, the Vietnam War, and uh, that just continued his road of separation from God. Uh, he, he recounts that he wasn't looking for God. He wasn't searching for God. There was no praying going on. There was no fasting going on. There was no seeking after God. He said that people wouldn't even want to be around him because he, he cursed so bad. And somehow, some way, he got connected to this, this young lady who was a Sunday school teacher. And she started writing him letters. And he thought that these letters were, you know, going to tell of her undying love for him. And at the end of these letters, she would put a verse. And so he thought that these verses would mean, you know, he, he thought she was trying to send him some kind of signal, some type of love note, like if he read this scripture, it would tell of her undying love for him. So he had to pull a Bible out. And so he, he, he had a Bible. It was still in the box. Someone had given him a long time ago. And so he pulled up the verse, and the verse had nothing to do with any undying love. It said, all have, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> but he had to read a verse every time he got a letter. And something began to work. You see, the word of God will never return void. So something, every time he read a verse, something would begin to work in him. But the most amazing thing about his testimony was that he was in a bar one night. This is before he was being released from Vietnam and being released from the military. He was in a bar. And he said this, Jesus came for me in the bar. Now, now most of us wouldn't think about going to the bar to, to witness to someone, um, but Jesus didn't mind showing up. And he wasn't seeking God. He wasn't hungering for God. Nothing had changed in his life. Nothing had changed in his lifestyle. He was doing nothing on his own to seek God, but he had a mother who was praying for him. No doubt she had prayed for him year after year after year. Someone was standing in the gap. Someone was making up the hedge. Someone was building a wall around him so that Jesus showed up while he's in the bar and Jesus spoke to him and said, it's your time. And when Jesus showed up that night, he went to the, his place of work, which was a, a bomb sh shelter where they made bombs. And he prayed that night. And, and all that night, he didn't know how to pray, so he just began to confess his sins. And he didn't know how to pray a generic prayer of confessing sins, so he confessed all of his sins. So every time a sin would come to his mind, he would confess that sin. And then another sin would come, and he would confess, and he did this all night. And he said he kept, he kept getting lighter and lighter and lighter. The more that he confessed, the lighter he got. Until all of a sudden God filled him with the Spirit that night. And he, he said he did, that, that morning when he left there, he literally stayed there all night. When he left the next day, he had no desire to drink. He had no desire for alcohol. He said he felt like he was floating above the earth. And that he was amazed because he would hear himself talking to people. And it was the first time in years he'd had a conversation where there weren't like multiple curse words going on. And he couldn't believe that this was him because of the power of the Spirit. When God hunts you down, 
There are times when God hunts for you. God is seeking. God is searching for people right now. God is seeking and God is searching for your friends, for your co-workers, for your family. God is seeking for them right now because this is the time. God said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his, fear, into his fields. And I hope that we are praying as a church and I hope that we are praying as believers that God would move on our behalf. God said to Israel, I looked, I searched through the earth to see if there was someone that would stand in the gap. Standing, that, that literally means when, when, a, when a city was broken into, overtaken, they would, they would tear down the wall. They would make a gap in the wall so that they could come in and they could terrorize that nation. And Jesus, God, God spoke and said that he was looking for someone that would make up a hedge or a wall around about the nation of Israel and that would stand in the gaps of the places that are already torn down, the places that are allowing the enemy to attack your family, the places that are allowing the enemy to attack your friends, the places that are allowing the enemy to destroy, to, to, to create strongholds in their minds where they cannot be free. God said if, if somebody would make up the hedge, is there somebody in your life that you're willing to pray over? Is there somebody in your life that you're willing to write down on a piece of paper and make a circle around it and say, I care about these people enough that I'm going to pray for them every day, that I'm going to be the hedge, that I'm going to be the wall, that I'm going to be the one that when the enemy comes and tries to destroy them, if there is a broken place in the wall, I'm going to stand in that gap and I'm going to be the one that will stand there between them and their destruction. Because none of us came to God because we were seeking for him. None of us came to God and found God because we were hungry for him. We found God because somebody prayed, because somebody sought after God, because somebody made up our gap, made up our hedge. And God is desiring to move in this earth. He is desiring to manifest his presence, but he needs a vessel to work through. But it's happening. I was talking to Mike McGurk last night. If you don't know Mike, he's over all of our campus ministry uh, activities for Antioch. There's multiple campus ministries where where we minister weekly. He's a tremendous young man, and uh, he has a great burden for the place where he went to high school in Severna Park. And, and I, I knew that there was a testimony that I wanted to share today, and, and so I, I talked to him last night just to, to get the background of, of how all of this transpired. But there's, if you don't know Mike, when he was... He wasn't hungry for God when he was a teenager. He was kind of doing his own thing. And God got a hold of him. And the transformation in his life was so dramatic that the sports that he participated in, he just quit. He just stopped. Stopped playing football. Stopped playing lacrosse. Stopped playing all the sports because he was, God transformed his life and, and he wanted to focus his life and get his life focused on God. But all of his friends that he hung out with when he wasn't living right, didn't understand that. And, and there was one young man in particular that, uh, that, that he remembered. He was a, a running back for the team. His dad was a head coach for the JV team. They played through their teens and through high school football. And uh, when Mike gave up sports his senior year, uh, this, this guy called him and he was drunk. And uh, he, he just... Mike said he cussed him out like, like he was a Mack truck. It was like, beep, 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 beep. He wasn't happy. He didn't understand why Mike was doing it, and, and he just laid into him, just, just cursed him nonstop and hung up the phone on him. Why are you doing this? You know, just calling him every kind of name that he could think of. 
And Mike just tried to tell him, hey, you know, I, I, I've got to make things right with God. Well, Mike lost contact with this guy. Basically, after that, he really didn't hang out with him that much. And uh, this guy went to Florida for for business degree in acting and uh, ended up leaving Florida to go to Hollywood to become an actor. Uh, he had he had a, a fair amount of success. He, he never ma- landed any major roles, but... But he, he had a lot of success in, in acting and rapping and things like that out in Hollywood. And uh, uh, for about five years, he just kind of pursued his own ways and his own, own path and ended up coming in contact with some Christians there and ended up going to a Bible study before one of the plays that he was acting in and uh, met some people there, and God started dealing with this guy. And, and God told him, he was called to ministry. This is a guy that wasn't hungering for God. This is a guy that that partied, that showed up to school drunk, that punched a teacher, that cussed like a sailor. This is not someone that was hungry for God. But Mike had always felt like this guy had something special that when he gave his life to God, that God was going to do something great. Well, Mike had tried to get in touch with him about a year ago, and, and it never worked out. And, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, if, uh, about a month ago, this guy reached out to Mike McGirt and wanted to meet with him and told him that God had called him to ministry, what God was doing. And so he shows up at our, our celebration service this past month, and about 10 seconds to the end of the worship service, God fills him with the Holy Ghost. But what started all of this was Mike got a burden for Saverna Park area. And about a year and a half ago, Mike started praying for Saverna Park and the people that he used to be with in Saverna Park. He's got five Bible studies going on right now. He, he, just, he runs into people at Chipotle and everywhere he's going, people that he used to be connected with, that God is opening up doors. Why? Not because these people hungered for God. Not because they were searching for God, but because someone was standing in the gap. Someone was making up the hedge. Someone was praying. Someone is fasting. Someone is loosing the power of God and the presence of God so that God can manifest himself in this earth. And so God is beginning to move in this guy's life. And, and, and he, he taught him a Bible study and, and he was about to go get baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and he, Mike teaches him a Bible study. He's like, oh, my goodness. I need to get baptized in Jesus' name. And so, so he wants to get baptized, and Mike's like, well, I'm not going to be at church this Sunday. And he's like, well, well let's do it tomorrow. And he's like, well, I have to get access to the church. He says, why do it at the church? Let's do it in the river. And so the guy gets baptized in Severn River and his parents show up and his friend shows up and his friend is an, you know, a, a druggy, alcoholic guy and, and, and he sees a revelation of who Jesus is. God is moving in this earth on people that aren't hungry for him, that aren't searching for him. Put Isaiah 65 and 1. Who, who's the man behind the curtain? Isaiah 65 and 1, I think that's it. Throw that up there. This this is what the prophet said. The prophet said, God decided that that because he knew Israel would reject him, and through Moses he prophesied that he was going to make Israel jealous through another nation. But Isaiah said it this way, I am found of them that sought me not. And I said, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Do you realize that that's happening? That people, if you are willing to pray, if you are willing to pray for your friends, for your neighbors, for your family, for your coworkers, I don't care if they're seeking God, I don't care what they're doing, that you have the power 
to pray until God moves in their life. How do I know this? Look at Saul. Saul is on the road to Damascus. Saul is completely opposing everything that Jesus is doing. He is not repentant. He is killing people who are doing what Jesus has asked them to do. If God shined a light out of heaven and showed Saul who he was because Saul was just special, is Saul more special than you or I? Is Saul more special than your family, than your friends, than your co-workers? God didn't reveal himself to Saul because he was special. God revealed himself because there was a church praying against the persecution that was happening in their day, in their hour. And when they begin to pray, God began to move. And it didn't matter how much Saul opposed, God laid him back on his back, God blinded him, and God said, I'm gonna send you to a man that's gonna tell you what you're about to do for my name's sake. Let me tell you, Mike's friend wasn't seeking God But God just showed up and said, I'm about to show you what I'm about to do in your life. I'm about to call you to ministry. I'm about to call you to a place in me. Let me tell you, there's some of you here that God is knocking on the door of your heart. There's some of you here, you weren't searching for God. You're not looking for God, but God showed up at your door. I know he did. I know because I've been praying. I know because your friends have been praying. I know because your family has been praying because we've been loosing the power of God, the presence of God so that he can manifest his power in your life because God loves you. God loves you. Musicians, if you would come. I I am so excited. I've had like six spiritual conversations this past week at work. I'm like, I'm like a kid at Carlson Donuts right now. And you don't, you don't want to see me around Carlson Donuts. I will embarrass you. I, I've, been, I've been praying for particular, I'm not going to name them, but I, I've been praying for certain individuals at my office And uh, one of them in particular told me the other day, he said, I quit smoking. This is like a month ago. He didn't know why. He just quit. Just decided to quit. This is after we had had a conversation where I was telling him how urgent I feel in my spirit about eternity. I just feel like eternity is so close that that there's this urgency inside of me to pray and to seek God and to do what He wants me to do. And uh, about a week or two later, he said, I wish you hadn't said that to me. He said, I can't sleep. His girlfriend that he's living with, he's not married, but they're living together. He was up at 1 o'clock And she asked him, what's wrong? And he said, I'm just thinking about God. He's telling me this. Why? Why would God show up at 1 o'clock? Because somebody's praying. Somebody, if, if if you would be willing, God asked us, to make up the head. Maybe you can't win everybody in the world. That's fine. But are there, are there names in, that you, you, th- you think of right now? A list of names. I, I've, got, I've got family members that are, that are separated from God. I've got co-workers. I've got neighbors that I, that I have literally put a circle around them and I am saying to God, God, I am going to be their wall. I am going to be their hedge. I'm going to be the one that prays until God shows up and shines a light out of heaven. 
Because if he's willing to do it for Saul and he's not willing to do it for someone else, then he's not God. If he treats anybody differently, if he loves anybody more than he loves anybody else, then he's not God. Because he is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And if he did it for one man, he'll do it for your friend, he'll do it for your family, he'll do it for your co-worker, but you and I have to make up our minds, I'm going to circle this group and I'm going to be their wall. I'm going to be their hedge. I'm going to be the one that will pray and repent for them when they won't. I'm going to be the one that will repent on their behalf so that God can move in their life. So that God can reveal himself to them. Because you and I benefited from somebody's prayer. You and I benefited. You and I weren't on the right road. Anybody bear witness with this? Come on, where were you when God found you? What were you doing when God showed up in your life? Can you stand today? God is looking for you. I, I don't know your background. I don't know your situation. I don't know your business. Don't want to know your business. But I know this without a doubt. I don't care who invited you here. I don't care how you came here. I don't care how far you feel separated from God. God is hunting you down. You hear me? Why? Because He loves you. And you don't good, do good to get God. We love, the Scripture says, because He first loved us. And He is going to be kind. And He is going to be patient. And He is going to stand in your way. He is a gentleman. He's not going to force down the door of your heart. I use this illustration all the time. The scripture says that God stands at our door and He knocks. I, I never knock at my house because I have this. And this gives me permission that when I get home, I stick it in and I go in because I own that place. But God doesn't own your heart. The only way, if God owns your heart, then He wouldn't knock. He would walk in. But He can't walk in because He can't violate your will and my will. And so in order for Him to have access in your life, you got to be the one to open up the door. So as much as I've told you God loves you today, and as much as I've told you how much He cares about you, and how He is hunting for you, how He is looking for you, all He can do this morning is stand at the door and knock and say, would you please let me in? But He's here. His presence is here. And He is knocking. And all you need to do to open up the door is do this right here. It's a universal sign of surrender. It says, God, you're welcome here. Could you do that this morning? Come on. I know you feel the presence of the Lord in this place. God is moving in this place. He is moving in this place. Would you? If you're willing to open up that door, would you just say, God, here I am. God, I know I've run for you, from you. I know I'm not where I need to be, God. I know I'm not who I need to be, God. But God, I know that you love me. Come on, God's Spirit is moving in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is hunting for you. God is searching for you. Come on, God is showing up because He has purpose for you. He says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. They are thoughts of peace and not evil to bring you to an expected end. God has purpose for your life. God has plans for you that are good. 
Come on, if you, if you feel like it, if you feel led of the Lord, why don't you pray with somebody next to you? Hallelujah. God, you're searching for us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, he's not far away. He's not far away. I know you feel like God is so far away, but he's not. He's just as close as the mention of his name. He's just as close as you surrendering. All it takes is turning your heart toward him, lifting up your hands and saying, God, I surrender. I surrender to you. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Take my hands, Lord, take my hands. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me.